We're good? Cool. OK, all right then. Um, so today I am going to be talking about my work on inpainting microstructural images with GANs. Um, and as part of this work, we developed two different approaches uh, to do this using deep convolutional gen, general uh, generative adversarial networks, which may sound very complicated, but we'll talk through that later. Um, just to start, I'm going to introduce our group. Um, so the head of our group uh, is Sam Cooper, Dr. Sam Cooper in the uh, design engineering department. Um, we are called the TLDR group, which um, we kind of chose because it was a bit funny and uh, not because it really means anything. Um, but generally we are we're the tools for learning, design and research. Very, very broad. Um, but kind of what ties everything that we do together is that we are building tools um, to help people with problems in uh, mainly energy materials um, to do with characterization and optimization of sort of material science problems. Um, and then the other members of the group, we've got uh, Liam who works on solid oxide fuel cell uh, interfaces and understanding those. And then uh, the bottom three, the bottom two there, uh, Steve and Amir, uh, also working on machine learning for battery uh, material problems, um, which I also I also work on. So the kind of problems that we're trying to solve, um, most of us in the group revolve around problems inside a battery. And battery, uh, the kind of structure of a battery is very multi length scale and very complicated, and we don't understand all of the different phenomena inside a battery. Um, and what you can see there is uh, a schematic of a cell, uh, and the cell is made of different components which all have different jobs. And each of those components have different problems associated with them, and those range from kind of hundreds of microns and even you know, on a battery um, pack level, you have that's on, you know, meters and centimeters all the way down to hundreds of microns and then down to nanometers. Um, and these complicated um, and interconnected phenomena are very hard to model and understand. And um, what we what we try to do in our group is um, one part is to characterize these materials and understand them, but also to try and link that back to how we can design better batteries, how we can affect our manufacturing process in order to try and mitigate some of these problems and optimize the performance for a given application. So in general, our aims are to develop tools and we do that using data-driven methods. And we're trying to solve characterization and optimization problems of uh, mainly in energy storage materials. One of the tools that we've developed is called Tau Factor. Tau Factor is a um, kind of GPU accelerated uh, Laplace solver for solving diffusion and um, co conductivity in uh, X-ray CT images. Um, and we this is available open source and very easy to use. So if you have any problems that you need to do uh, to model diffusion or uh, conductivity, then um, Tau Factor is for you. Another tool that uh, was developed in the group by Steve is called SliceScan, and SliceScan is uh, a method for turning 2D images of materials into 3D volumes uh, using generative adversarial networks, which is a bit of a theme in the group. We use GANs for a lot of what we do. Um, and then taking that method, we then applied that to loads of different microstructures, um, and we created a little library of all these 3D microstructures uh, that we take a 2D image and we generate 3D volumes. Um, and those 3D volumes don't have um, a kind of ground truth analog. These are completely artificially synthetic 3D volumes, uh, which gives you access to new information about the material. You can model different behaviors. And if I just show you what that website looks like, here it is. We just got a little. It's kind of searchable. Um, can you see that from there? Probably not. Okay. Right. Let's see. How about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've got this searchable 
um, database of 3D volumes, um, and there's a few different things that you can search on, what, what's in it, how it was measured, um, and some other stuff, um, sort of material properties. And for each of these um, materials, you can see with a 2D image that was used to generate it, um, and some more information about what where that data came from, and also all of the parameters of the models that we used to generate it. Um, and part of that process was we did some in-painting, which is what today's talk is mainly going to be about. Um, and then finally, a paper that was recently accepted um, is a project called Data Fusion, where we used, again, generative adversarial networks to combine different uh, data, data types into uh, a single kind of unified volume. Um, and that's driven by the idea that different imaging techniques can capture different information at different resolutions to you know, image different phases. And if we want to try and combine those into a, a single unified view of a material, we've developed this uh, machine learning technique. Um, OK, and the kind of these characterization tools and these tools for helping us understand materials are um, designed with an eventual aim of seeing a bigger picture process of what what we're trying to do. And that is we're trying to use all of these different tools to piece together this cycle of design optimization of um, these materials and the devices. So the kind of ultimate question that we're trying to answer is how do we make battery materials, uh, how do we manufacture battery materials better in order to optimize their performance for a particular application? And so all of these different pieces fit into this optimization loop where um, manufacturing battery materials takes a long time in the lab. So our generative machine learning methods helps us speed up the process of actually creating new microstructure. We have developed these tools for simulating um, and modeling different uh, battery properties such as tau factor for extracting these transport metrics. We also use the uh, PyBAM open source uh, battery modeling library. Um, and then we link that all together with some Bayesian optimization. And uh, our aim is to try and put together this. We're searching through the different manufacturing parameter space to try and optimize our batteries um, for a specific application. That's not what today's talk is going to be about, even though it sounds much more interesting. That's something we're still working on, and I'm sure we'll talk in the future more about that. So my talk today is about in-painting, which seems quite far removed from that. So why do we need in-painting and what is it? So like I just said, part a, a large part of that process of the optimization and the design of materials involves imaging them um, because that's how we characterize them. That's how we extract information. That's how we can do our modeling is that we need to be able to image materials and the um, Often the techniques that we use to image materials can be quite sensitive to defects, bad sample preparation, and that can lead to uh, these kind of uh, unusable parts of an image, um, which then mess up all of our calculations for metrics, don't allow us to model across our whole image, which then reduces the kind of uh, how representative our modeling is and kind of destroys that whole workflow. So what we want to try and do is replace those uh, destruct these these kind of uh, parts of the image that have been destroyed or that are not valid with things that are. And this has been done in other um, areas, not in uh, not so much in material science, but in other kind of uh, the more sexy areas of machine learning, like generating faces and for self-driving cars and stuff, um, like scene recreation. Um, and so essentially what in-painting is, is re replacing uh, an occluded region. By occluded, I mean something that has been masked as being bad um, with with a generated uh, data with matching boundaries. So something that, you know, has a seamless border with the uh, ground truth data, uh, but has been artificially generated. Um, so. More specifically, when we're talking about microstructure, what we're talking about is replacing the occluded regions with statistically similar generated microstructure with matching boundaries. 
So it's important here to note that this is a stochastic method. We are not trying to recreate what is underneath the thing that we've masked because we don't know what it is. What we're trying to do is uh, replace it with uh, microstructure that is statistically indistinguishable from the rest of the image. Uh, and there are lots of ways of doing that. It's, it's not a one to one uh, mapping. There are lots of equivalent, uh, statistically equivalent uh, ways of inpainting the same thing. And what we want to try and do is make sure that what we've done is statistically indistinguishable. OK, so how can we do inpainting? So uh, a uh, sort of more the historic way of doing it without machine learning has been used to uh, has been sort of using more common statistical methods to replace these parts of the images. Uh, and one of them is called exemplar based inpainting, and that essentially is where we look at the rest of the image. And we find the uh, closest matching patches of the image and we copy and paste them into the, the bits where um, they match the best and is very successful. Uh, it works very well for some applications. Um, but what you remember is that when, when you're doing that, you are literally taking up bits of the image that already exist somewhere else and putting them in. And so you don't, you're not generating anything new. You're actually replacing it with parts of the image that already exist. And if you have a data set where you're worried about how representative it might be, um, the replacing, you know, with parts of an image that already exist, you kind of, you run into problems with some parts of the image being overly represented in your in your data. Um, there are other statistical methods uh, that I'm not going to talk about because not really that important. Um, and then there's the machine learning methods. So with uh, machine learning image tasks, uh, computational like image tasks, the machine learning technique that we often employ are uh, convolutional neural networks. And these are neural networks made up of convolutional layers and convolutions are just mathematical operations that we like to use on image data because they um, take spatially distributed information and process it. Um, and so these convolutional neural networks is what makes up most of the techniques that we see for any sort of image based task, whether that's classification, generation, in this case, in painting. Um, and we've seen the common uh, CNN architectures being used for in-painting, uh, all of them from autoencoders and uh, diffusion models and GANs, uh, all being applied to different in-painting tasks, and they all have their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, and also, more recently, we've seen these very big models emerge um, that have become open source and now being very widely used. The best example of that is the stable diffusion model, which was released a few weeks ago, that is now being used for all sorts of things like text prompts to, uh, to video generation and, and, and everything. And, and in-painting has been shown to be successful with those big models um, for more general tasks. But we have a very specific task where we're trying to in-paint microstructure for materials applications. And those bigger models, <clears throat> although they work for most like general applications, um, for very specific applications, they're not so strong uh, because we have certain criteria we need to fulfill when we're in painting microstructure and uh, we need to develop new models in order to constrain um, our uh, in painting method. OK, so what are generative adversarial networks? Um, this is going to start off with a very um, kind of more intuitive analogy for what they are. Um, so generative adversarial networks involve two players in a game. One of them is a uh, detective and one of them is a fraudster and the fraudster is trying to generate um, an example of something that is indistinguishable to the detective. In this case we're going to choose somebody who's painting, who's uh, trying to emulate a certain painting stuff. So the way that a generative adversarial network uh, learns is it's a, it's a joint learning, simultaneous learning of both of the players in the game. So the first thing that happens in a generative adversarial network training is the uh, fraudster tries to trick the detective, but they don't know anything about what it should look like. Um, and so they make a pretty bad guess at it. We then also have access to what it's meant to look like. This is our training data. And we give both of those things to the detective 
and we tell the detective this one is real and this one is fake and the detective then starts to learn what real looks like and what fake looks like and then the key part of training um, began is that you you update both of these players in the game uh, and the detective then gives some information to the fraudster to say I know this one's fake and this one's real and this is kind of why I know these are the features in the image that have given me the biggest clues and then the fraudster has another go and this time their guess is slightly better and now the detective's job is slightly harder and they give their information back to the fraudster and then the fraudster eventually learns how to perfectly uh, replicate the training data um, and although in this case it's not a one-to-one -one, uh, I've shown them creating exactly the same thing uh, you can imagine that we have a, in our training data we have lots of examples of a distribution of things and then the what the fraudster learns to do is generate samples from that distribution not necessarily recreate exactly the one thing um, okay so this looks like uh, this sort of general architecture where we have our fraudster in a GAN is called a generator and our detective is called a discriminator so that and they're two convolutional neural networks rather than people um, and something important to note is the input to a generator uh, to our thing that is generating our, our fake images is this thing that I've labeled here Z which uh, we will call a seed and a seed is just a vector of random numbers and why we give this to our generator is our generator is just a set of uh, parameters which essentially form a set of rules of how to generate a fake image um, and we need to in introduce some uh, st stochastic stochasticity to our system because our generator wants to be able to generate something new every time that looks like something from the real distribution. Um, otherwise, if it was to generate the same thing every time, the discriminator's job would be very easy. It would know ah, it looks the same every time that I know this one's fake and therefore I know exactly what to look for. So our, our random our vector of random numbers allows the generator to to use those random numbers to generate different samples every time um, and that's uh, going to be very important for the way that we do in painting because actually in in painting uh, when we've selected a region that we want to inpaint we actually want the generator to generate the same orders every time uh, because you can't create completely random samples because we've constrained our problem to say you have to look like this at certain points and um, we tackle that in two different ways so GANs have, we've used GANs for generating microstructure in our group um, and we've learned some important things about how we can build the most simple networks that contain as much of the assumptions and the uh, properties of the materials we're generating as possible. So this was the first paper by um, Andrea who actually gave an energy futures talk a few years ago, which is the reason why I started doing this uh, joined this group in the first place and her work was generating uh, microstructural images using GANs um, and what her work introduced was this idea of the seed that we give our generator um, these this vector of random numbers you can manipulate that in a way such that you can generate images of arbitrary size because the microstructure that we deal with is homogeneous it looks the same in every direction and therefore, once you've learned what a small patch looks like, you then know what a arbitrarily large patch looks like um, and you can manipulate that using the seed. Um, Steve then went on to take that, uh, those ideas and uh, create an architecture that can turn 2D images into 3D volumes, which I already mentioned earlier. Um, and again, exploring some of the, the ideas of in the GANs that we use, what constraints can you put on the system to incorporate some of the um, the simplifications and also the like material properties that we're looking for? And in our case, we're looking at um, homogeneity and also uh, isotropy in in lots of applications. So looking the same in every direction in every uh, region of your microstructure is statistically equivalent to any other. Okay, so the first in painting method that going to introduce is what we call the generator optimization method. So um, it's a it's a slight change in the uh, training 
regime to what I described earlier with, which was more of a straightforward vanilla GAN training. Now um, we uh, we train our generator in the usual way where we give it a random seed input. It generates a fake uh, example and then feeds that to the discriminator. But at the same time as doing that during training, we also pass the generator a fixed seed. So a seed that doesn't change every time. It's not a vector of random numbers. It's a vector of fixed numbers that we fix at the beginning of training. <coughs> and the reason we do that is this is what we're telling the generator. This seed corresponds to the um, outer boundary that you're trying to match. And the way that we enforce that is the output of our generator uh, from this fixed seed. We take the difference between the border that that generates and the ground truth border that we're trying to match to. So we take the mean squared error of those two and we introduce that into our loss function, which is what our generator is trying to optimize. And, and we tell the generator, we give, it, we give it that information that we're trying to minimize that difference. So now the generator has two bits of information that it's trying to, uh, that when it does its optimization and updates its parameters that it's trying to do. One of them is trick the discriminator, which is what the kind of more general GAN uh, framework is trying to trick the discriminator into, um, so the discriminator can't tell which is real and which is fake. And it's trying to match the boundary when given this specific seed. Now, the reason why that's important distinction between the random seed and the fixed seed is because we can't give, if we were to give our generator a fixed seed every time um, when training the with the discriminator, the discriminator would learn uh, what the generator was outputting every time and it would know it was fake and it would be too easy a job for the discriminator. So we get to still maintain that randomness when trying to train the generator um, into being a good generator and be able to generate samples that trick the discriminator. But then we introduce the fixed seed in a slightly different way to for the to try and solve that problem of matching the boundaries. Now the the other technique that we've developed is called which we call seed optimization is we separate those tasks out and we we don't do them simultaneously during training. We do one we train the generators to start with, so we exactly the same as how we described earlier. We just uh, give the generator a random seed. It generates fake examples, gives it to the discriminator. The discriminator tells the generator um, how to update in order to become more real. Once our generator is trained, we then, instead of optimizing the, the parameters of the generator, we optimize the param parameters of a, of a given seed. So what that means is we give our generator a, a, a specific seed. The generator generates a, an example. It's already trained, so that example looks like real microstructure, but it doesn't match the boundaries of our region yet. What we then do is calculate the mean squared error between the um, border pixels and our ground truth matching region, and we then say minimize this but we keep the generator's parameters fixed and instead we update the seed. So the seed is just a vector of numbers. We then search that space, which we call the latent space of the seed. We search for a seed where the output of the generator matches the um, ground truth. So those two ways of doing it. Um, and the differences are with the generator optimization method. So when we're doing the both, um, trying to do both tasks at the same time, uh, the what we end up with is, is a generator that specifically can inpaint a single region uh, because it's learned, it's built into the parameters of the generator how to match the boundary. Uh, what also is the case is it's very fast to evaluate because once we've trained it, um, we just need to put something through, uh, put our seed through our generator and then our output is, is uh, the one that we want. The other method, the seed optimization method, what because we've trained our generator independently of doing the matching the boundaries task, it means that we can use that same generator to uh, inpaint any region of our image uh, and we don't need to retrain our generator because the same parameters in our generator can be used to inpaint any image. It's the, the values of the seed um, that tell us how to match the, the boundaries. The 
downside of this is that the uh, evaluating uh, a new inpainting region is slower because in order to do an inpainting, we have to do an optimization of our seed every time, and that can take a little bit of time. So that's the they're the kind of um, a priori differences between these two methods. And then we once we uh, built these methods and applied them to different things, we can see that there's also some differences in the way that they uh, perform. OK, so before we look at how they um, how these two methods uh, performed, we need to understand how we can measure goodness of performance, which is quite difficult because really the ultimate measure of it, of a, in painting how good it is is how good does it look to a human eye that is the that's the kind of test that we really want to do um, and we could you know send out loads of images and ask people to look at it and get experts to do it but can't really be bothered to do that so we develop some metrics that measure different um there are two different tasks that the inpainting has to do so one of the tasks is uh, how good is the microstructure? How statistically similar is the microstructure that we develop, um, that we generate? How statistically similar is that to the rest of the microstructure? And that will tell us if our generator has done a good job at being a good generator, tricking the discriminator, creating fake samples that look like the real ones. Um, the other thing that it has to do is, is match the borders. So how do we, um, how do we measure how good do the borders match? Well, for the goodness of microstructure, it's quite easy. We can use microstructural metrics to compare between the ground truth and the and the real. So, for example, we can calculate things like the volume fraction of our ground truth data and compare that to the volume fraction of our generated data and see see how they vary. That will tell us how good our microstructure is. And the goodness of the borders is a little bit more tricky. Um, so what we developed was a um, a method of comparing the distribution of the mean squared errors of the bordering pixels. And what I mean by that is if you imagine we take uh, in this case, we've got uh, a border here between the uh, the microstructural data and an inpainting, which we've just inpainted with zeros, just so it's obvious. Um, so the yellow pixels there are the bordering pixels of the inpainted region and the red, the sort of highlighted red pixels are those that are from the ground truth. And this is at the border. So if we take the difference between neighboring pixels and we square it, this will give us a distribution of mean squared errors of pixels. Um, because for, for each pair, we get a value. Um, and then what we can do is they're, they're if you imagine that every neighboring set of pixels in every neighboring set of pixels um, in the ground truth data, if we were to do that for every pixel that exists in the ground truth data, we would get a distribution of mean squared errors as well. Obviously, not all neighboring pixels look exactly the same. There will be a distribution of, of these mean squared errors and we can compare the two distributions so we can look at how different does our in painting border distribution of mean squared errors look from the ground truth border and we can do a statistical test to look at how different do these distributions look and that will give us an indication of how well these the borders that we've generated look like like naturally occurring neighboring pixels in our ground truth data so the first um the first case that we're going to look at is applying uh the two in painting methods to a segmented three-phase material of solid oxide fuel cell and so the the uh, blue squares here represent the outer the outer blue square is uh the whole image you can see on the right uh and then the inner blue square is where we've cut the in painting so you can see that all the images on the right have the same outer border and then it's it's uh, the inside that has been inpainted by the two methods. Uh, and the top row there is the generator optimization method and the bottom row is the seed optimization method. And you can clearly see that there's no distinguishable border 
uh, in those two methods. Uh, but you can see that the seed optimization method has generated quite a lot more white phase than the gender. Uh, the seed optimization has generated more white phase than the generator optimization. Um, so they both appear to perform pretty well. But let's have a look at the the two methods that we have for analyzing uh, both the goodness of the microstructure and the goodness of the uh, borders. So here is a plot of the distribution of volume fractions for each of the phases. So we've got the um, if we just look at the the first phase, the poor phase, um, we've got the real uh, volume fraction distribution, and so this is taken from 128 samples from our um, ground truth data. We just sample our ground truth, calculate the volume fraction of that, and, and we get this distribution. The, uh, if we look at the generator optimization uh, volume plots, we got one on the left and one on the right. The one on the left represents what, what does our generator produce when we don't give it our optimized seed. So remember that when we were training our generator uh, optimization method, we had a fixed seed that we were using to match the borders during training, but it was training on a random seed as well. So this is what happens if we give it a random seed. And you can see that the distribution of volume fractions looks nice and similar to the crown truth. So what that's telling us is that our generator is capable of generating things that look like they come from the ground truth. The half violin on the right, which is smaller and slightly offset, is what happened is, is the uh, distribution of volume fractions that we get from our fixed seed. Um, and uh, you can see that the the uh, mean is offset and the distribution is smaller. And this is to be expected because once we've constrained our generator to match the borders, we have shrunk the space of possible microstructures. We've we've um, limited it to be generating microstructures that fit these borders, and therefore we don't expect it to produce the same distribution. Um, instead, we expect it to kind of shrink to a subset of the possible distribution of possible microstructures. Um, and you can see there that the kind of distribution sits inside of the um, the ground truth distribution. Uh, and so the same goes for the Z optimization method. We got the what happens if you give it a random seed and then what happens if you uh, give it this optimized seed? You do this optimization process and um, you get the output. And interestingly, what you can see here is that the generator optimization method performs pretty well for both uh, for all three phases. But in the, met the metal and ceramic uh, phases, the seed optimization suddenly shifts by quite a lot, and the distributions are very offset from the unoptimized distribution. And you know that's that was quite obvious in this picture. We can see that the white phase is being overly represented in this optimization. And what this is telling us is that whilst we're doing the optimization process with uh, uh, in the seed optimization case, we're Every iteration, we're telling it to try and find a seed that looks like uh, the borders match. Is that we're moving away from what is realistic, because whilst we do that optimization process, we're not constraining uh, G to try and be realistic. That has ha that happens during training. That's when we we need a discriminator in order to do that. And so what happens is if we optimize the seed in isolation, the generated output looks less real. So that's one of the weaknesses of the seed optimization case. OK, and let's have a look at what happens when we compare the distribution of um, mean squared errors on the on the border. Here's a uh, an example of what the uh, we, we, we wanted to test the uh, the border like contiguity analysis on things that we understand are going to be bad so that we can see what good might look like. Um, so first we do it on the ground truth on itself. And for this mark structure, we get a, uh, we calculate this distribution, we compare it to the ground truth and we do a KS test. And what you can see reported here is the P values of that KS test. So the probability that those distributions are sampled from the same thing. Um, and you can see that for the, when we impaint with zeros, we get a pretty small value. When we in paint with noise, we get 
a very small value. And when we impate with this random seed, so something that's not been trained to match the borders, we also get a very small value. So it's saying, what that's telling us is that these are significantly different from sampling from the ground truth, which is kind of what we know. When we do that analysis with these inpainted examples, we get a p-value of one, telling us that the distribution of mean squared errors on the border is indistinguishable from uh, the ground truth, which we can we can see that with our eyes um, quite clearly. So both methods, when using an n-phase material, are pretty successful. OK, now a slightly harder problem. What happens if it's not segmented n-phase? What happens if it's uh, grayscale? So now in the output of your generator isn't trying to tell us which phase each pixel belongs to. It's actually a continuous value between 0 and 1, or 0 and 255. Um, and the both methods um, do slightly worse here. It is a harder problem. Um, you can see that the generator optimization method is mostly, the borders are mostly um, indistinguishable, but the seed optimization method, there you start to see um, like visible uh, disc discontinuities at the border. And when we do our border analysis, we see that the values that we get are um, now significant by the measure of, you know, 0 0.05 is your, if your p-value is less than that, but more kind of instructive is that they uh, are, are many orders of magnitude smaller than the ground truth. So this is saying that they are they are distinguishable borders from the ground truth, but compared to terrible ways of inpainting, you know, the orders of magnitude uh, difference in the p-value there um, are huge. And so it is significantly better than painting it with noise, which we would hope. Um, and Finally, an example where we've got, we're using colour, so now we've got three output channels, which continuously vary between zero and one. And we do the same analysis, and we see here that the ground truth um, is actually, um, has a significant p-value, which is interesting. Um, and our in-painted methods have a uh, much smaller p-value, and then the other methods even smaller. So we can see here that basically for grayscale and colour, these methods do perform worse and are distinguishable, but for the segmented end phase materials, they are um, indistinguishable from, from the ground truth. OK, so in summary, what are these two methods good at? Um, just quickly, actually, here, you can see here that um, the seed optimization, so this bottom row, has started, has started to create unrealistic looking features. We've got this sort of blurry, weird stuff going on around the border and this is something that we see when the c optimization is um struggling to match the, the boundary because remember that we're optimizing the seed post training and so what happens is the seed in order to match the boundary the seed starts moving off in weird directions and starts to sample from the uh, latent space in areas that haven't been sampled very much during training so our generator doesn't really know what to do with them, and we start um, generating these unrealistic features. So what are they good at? Well, the generator optimization is uh, better in general at doing the border matching, and in general is uh, makes better microstructure. It doesn't it doesn't start making these unrealistic features when it's doing its optimization because we've constrained that during the training, um, and the evaluation uh, process is often much faster. Uh, because we don't have to do the optimization post training, uh, yeah, post training, <coughs> and um, the downsides of this method is that every time you want to impaint a new region, you have to retrain your generator, um, and because the training process has an extra step in it, it has this uh, the uh, including the mean squared error, uh, it is slower at training than than the seed optimization. So the seed optimization, the benefits are that it's faster training and also you don't need to retrain every time you want to impaint a new region on your material. Uh, but the downsides are that the borders are worse, um, especially for grayscale and colour. Uh, the microstructure can uh, move into being unrealistic and the evaluation is quite slow, well, slower than the generator optimization. OK, so 
these methods are useful for some cases and not so good at others. Um, in order to make it actually useful and usable and not just interesting, um, we created this graphical user interface because it's a very visual problem that people, when, when you have uh, defects in your material, um, there are people have developed methods for like automatic detection of them, but actually it often is something that is, uh, a, that's a job done by the human eye. So you want to have a look at your material, identify any defects, select those, and then paint them. So hopefully I can give you a demo of that. If it works. Oops, that's not good. So can you see that over there? OK, so let's run the front end. OK, so here's our little graphical user interface, and this is going to give you a sense of like the timings of things as well. So often with big machine learning networks, they take hundreds of hours, days, months to train um, with huge data sets because of the networks that we're using and the methods that we developed. We've tried to simplify as much as possible, shrink our networks down, introduce as many of the assumptions that we can in order to speed everything up so we can actually just Select where our in painting uh, want to happen. Click train. And the training process begins and it will every 100 iterations, it will update with its new best guess. And if we just get rid of that border, you can see that slowly over the iterations, the border becomes more seamless and the microstructure starts to look more like the outside. Um, and now the question is, when is it done? Well, it's done when you think it's done when the borders look indistinguishable, when you uh, can't tell the difference between them. And so the uh, the reason why this is very fast is one, because of the networks, one, because I've got a big GPU. So it's, this is a bit of a cheat. It's not going to work like this on CPU. Um, yeah. And so once we can stop the training and generate new uh, examples of our in painting, just to demonstrate that it's a stochastic method, uh, where the borders still match, but we're generating the internal, uh, uh, different internal match structures. Okay. And that is everything for in-painting. Um, I realise that everything I talked about at the beginning, about other stuff that we do in, in our group, went over very quickly, but very happy to answer questions about anything to do with in-painting, also anything to do with what we do in our group. Um, any of our other work as well. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yep. So when you are uh, taking images or, or scanning to the factory materials, how, how like how common is it for them to have an artifact or a defect that makes it so the image isn't usable? Is this something that happens a lot or is this quite uncommon? Yeah, so it is it's it's pretty common. Um, I don't have a quantifiable uh, thing of how common it is, but um, a lot of the so the sample preparation techniques is where you introduce a lot of defects. So any sort of like etching, um, a lot of the when we're imaging battery materials, we use um, laser um, like lasers to cut surfaces and then you polish and you etch and all these sorts of things. And every time you're doing any sort of like removing of layers or removing of material, you introduce the possibility of scratches. Um, and so scratches are, are common and also do a lot of electron beam microscopy. And depending on the um, the like the energy of the of the electron beam, you can introduce all sorts of aberrations and um, like imaging artifacts as well. So there's like two main common uh, types. You get the scratches where you've actually done something physical to a material, and then there's the imaging artifacts as well. Um, and also a lot of the case uh, doing the imaging is is a destructive process. So for, if you're doing um, the like focused iron beam cutting of stuff, you're actually removing your sample and destroying it and doing an imaging process that's kind of like that's irreversible. And so in order to do that again, if you make a mistake, if there's aberrations, if there's defects, you often have to re um, fabricate 
your material, do the imaging again. The imaging slow as well. So it, it, having a having a tool like this could potentially save you a lot of sample and also time on that. No idea of how long the like time to deploy something like this compares to just retaking. redoing it. Uh, so it's a good question. So the training time for a microstructure it very much varies on the problem. So like I showed you the example of doing this material, um, inventing this material here, um, which you know took forty two thousand milliseconds. <laughs> Should be really good seconds. Um, so like forty two seconds. Uh, and it's done something pretty reasonable. You can train it for longer and it will be and it will work better. When you if we instead load in, shouldn't really do this because it's going to make make my technique look worse. But if we put in something that's not so easy to. Um, that's not a good example. So, say this color. Um, and we then instead, um, so, so we train that, we end up, uh, it ends up taking a lot longer. And so, because the like task is much more complicated, Problem with a live demo in it. <laughs> Still things to, to iron out here, obviously. I'll try one more time. Okay. Yeah, so you'll see that the the other method was quite quick at, at getting something to look reasonable. This method, much slower, takes a longer time for it to reach something that looks reasonable because it's a slightly harder problem and so it depends on the the, the problem that you're trying to solve um for one and also i guess on how long your fabrication and your uh, imaging takes as well some if you want to take a really big image of a material at a high resolution that can take days to do the, that imaging um and your fabric if your fabrication of your materials is like super quick and your imaging is super quick then maybe it's not worth it but this the kind of time scales that we're talking about is to train something like this so that it looks like what it looked like in my presentation would take a couple of hours with a gpu um whereas re-imaging something at a high resolution can take a few days so it could save you time it depends on your problem uh, how the generator uh, learns by getting feedback information from the discriminator, mm -hmm. but I don't understand how the discriminator initially from the beginning yes yeah. how to tell the difference. So, so my um, explanation was simplified and focused on the generator. So the, the both the networks are just a um, big set of parameters so it's just got um loads of parameters that it can change and those parameters control uh the what we call the kernels in the convolutions so basically you get a bit of image pass it through a convolution and it gives you a value that's kind of what convolution does what that value is depends on the the kernel of your convolution and that's what the generator and the discriminator can update those values to try and work out to eventually to get a value which tells for the discriminator's case the, uh, the idea is that you take this image, you pass it through loads of those layers, and it gives you a value at the end which says, is it real or is it fake? And what we end, what we do is when we pass our um, real image to our discriminator and our fake image to our discriminator, what we um, what we get out at the end is a loss function. Um, and the loss function has been formulated in a way that when we're training the discriminator, we get uh, a value for when it's been given real data, a value for when it's been given fake data, and we then what we what's called back propagate, um, which is we send that information back through the discriminator and it updates its weights accordingly. And the way the what the your loss function looks like depends on what training uh, regime you're doing. And 
in our case, we're, we're doing something called a, a Wasserstein GAN with gradient penalties. So it's a little bit more complicated, but in the original uh, sort of GAN framework, the very first one, the uh, way that it was trained was essentially the discriminator outputs a value between zero and one. And it's one if it's real and zero if it's fake. I can't remember if that's the right way around, but let's say it is. It's one, it's real, zero, it's fake. It, when you give your real data into your discriminator, it outputs a value. Let's say it's not very close to one. When you back propagate, what your what your loss function tells you is try to make that value more like it's one to the discriminator. And the discriminator will update its its parameters so that now when the real data gets passed through, it's close to one. So that's what the discriminator's job is trying to do. Now, if you imagine what the generator is trying to do, the generator wants to give fake data to the discriminator and it doesn't it wants the discriminator not to know what that is and so it wants the discriminator to give the wrong um assigned label it wants to the generator wants the discriminator to output zero when it's real and one when it's fake and so what what happens is the discriminator gets a different task to the generator and they both are being trained uh, they, they're trained in consecutive steps. So you first train the discriminator in, in one iteration of your training loop. You train your discriminator with, in one step, and then you train your generator in the next step, and then you repeat. And so they iteratively get um, updated in, in this training process at the, like simultaneously. Um, and what you'll find is that it's quite unstable for a lot of problems, and one of them might be much better than the other. And you can tweak different things in your network to try and balance it out. Let's say your discriminator is much better at your than your generator. Let's say it's really easy to distinguish between real and fake and really hard to generate fake. Then what you'll end up happening is your discriminator will start to dominate the um, training process and it will be very easy for it to distinguish. It will always output one for real and zero for fake and the generator just can't do anything about it. And in that case, this your GAN won't work. Um, sometimes your discriminator is rubbish and it's it can't distinguish between real and fake even from the beginning and in that case it can't give the generator any useful information either and so your GAN won't work in that case and so balancing the kind of um, power of the two networks is something that you have to be quite careful about. Sorry? Uh, any other questions? No? Yeah. So the, the Palette images, you've got grayscale and you've got different phases. Can you kind of do the training in stages? So can you kind of take a colored image first into end phase, train it on that, and then you kind of use that as a starting point for the more complicated? You, you mean maybe for like this one? You yeah. mean like. Could you like turn that into an end phase mm -hmm. and try and simplify the problem, allow it to train, learn, learn on that, and generate the image? Mm -hmm. It's an interesting proposition. Um, the thing is, when you're when you have a generator that generates an end phase material, the final layer in the uh, network is what's called a softmax, which is a function that um, which says for every pixel, output a probability essentially in in each of the phases. So for a three phase material, you have three channels and it will uh, assign a number close to one when it thinks it's probable that this pixel belongs to this phase. And then so when we present an image like this, what we've done is taken the for every pixel, we've taken the maximum uh, where the maximum probability is we've assigned it as that pixel. And that's why it looks like this. So it's uh, the the actual architecture of the network is quite different, whereas in a grayscale, the out final layer of the network is just a sigmoid, something between zero and one. And so I'm not sure how. Yeah, and how similar what the networks would learn um, to do the two tasks, because it's quite a different um, problem in lots of ways. One is assigning a probability, the other one is like trying to match the exact value. And actually what I've found is that um when for example accidentally ran the end phase material in the color mode so it was didn't have the 
softmax uh, probability at the end. It just had a sigmoid um, and it had three channels because it's RGB color and it actually does very well at doing the end phase. Um, so the thing about the end phase that makes it easy is one because the final layer of the material is um, uh, of the architecture is a uh, softmax, which means that it doesn't have to ever get it exactly right. It just has to get the one with the highest probability right. Um, but also the actual task of generating something that looks very like cleanly separated into phases is, is easy. Um, so what would be would definitely be easy is if you turn that into a two or three phase material and ran it, it would it would be it would work really well. But then translating that back into grayscale, unless you had like a, a reversible segmentation process, yeah, but then you'd lose lots of information, I imagine. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks. Cool. Thanks.